So, <clears throat> many of us, whether we like to read or not, it's apparent not only in uh, movies, but also, or books, but also in movies and in sitcoms and all different types of things. There's a device that's often used to communicate called foreshadowing, right? So in foreshadowing, we're kind of, um, let's see, dropping breadcrumbs along the way and uh, showing you things that are going to take place later. And sometimes the thing about foreshadowing is, well, many times, you kind of have to watch, if you're watching it, you have to watch a movie two or three times before you can kind of pick up on some things. Uh, there are a number of movies like that. <clears throat> So, since tonight is youth night, I thought I would, um, I would just pick a classic Disney movie that kind of shows this. Underrated classic Disney movie, okay? The Emperor's New Groove. If you've never seen it, you should. It's much better than all the other things. I did not want my kids being raised on SpongeBob SquarePants. I don't like it. It annoys me. I can't listen to it. So, I introduced them to classics and... Uh, so the emperor's new groove is there. The basic plot line is <clears throat> you have a young man who is a king, and uh, he's extremely arrogant, and the lady who raises him wants to um, do away with him. She thinks she is poisoning him in order to kill him. But actually, they mix up the potions, and he's turned into a llama. Okay? And then, of course, the rest of the show was how do you get back, and how does he get out of his state of being a llama, and... All this kind of stuff, but <clears throat> it, the story starts out with him as a llama, and he's crying <laughs> in the jungle somewhere with the rain coming down, and you know, me 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 me, just doing all kinds of stuff. And um, he says, "Look," he, he's kind of introducing himself to the audience, and he says, "You don't believe me? Let's just go back to the beginning." And it goes way back to the time when he's a baby. And it's supposed to be a humorous thing because he's like, no, not that early. That's not what I meant. But look at me. Look how cute I was. But it, in that moment when there's a flashback of him as a baby, he's surrounded by toys. And if you pay attention closely, <clears throat> there are certain toys there that are of good size. A llama, a parrot, and a whale. And that's because, obviously, in the movie, for the majority of the movie, he's a llama. As he is going back to <clears throat> basically take his kingdom back, he goes and he raids all the different potions, and they try a couple of different potions, and in one of them he turns into a parrot, and then another one he turns into a whale. But you see, in that short moment, <clears throat> in an early part of the movie that seems insignificant, the writers are telling us something about what is to come. And um, it's, it's one of the great hallmarks of creativity and storytelling and writing, whether it be writing a book or writing a script for a movie or a play. One of the things that <clears throat> I love about God and his word are the breadcrumb trails, so to speak, that he leaves for us. The foreshadowing that he <clears throat> has embedded into scripture. For an example, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, when he's talking, uh, he's making his argument concerning the law. He says in chapter 10 and verse 1, For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of those things. So the law being the shadow of the good things to come, but not the image. So the shadow, when you look and you see a shadow on the ground, the shadow is not the thing. Okay? <clears throat> You can only have a shadow because you have substance. There has to be something of substance which the sun hits correctly that then casts a shadow. And so that's the way the Bible uses that language. So you have a shadow, which is kind of a rough figure looking thing. And then you have the substance, what it's pointing to. And so <clears throat> in Christianity, in Scripture, following Old Testament into New, there are a number of these things. One of the shadows I want us to kind of trace for just a minute and, and not <clears throat> uh, spend a long time doing this, just kind of chart the path and then uh, encourage you to look at that a little bit further as we go through, is one location known as Mount Moriah. It... <clears throat> If you know what later happens on Mount Moriah, 
then you can see that it's actually pretty prevalent. But it's not called Mount Moriah many times. It's called something else. And we'll see what that is here in just a little bit. So I want to look at three events <clears throat> that took place on Moriah and see how those memorable moments God was kind of setting a substance in front of the sun and kind of casting a shadow for us. He was dropping some breadcrumbs for us to go, I wonder what this is. So, let's begin in 2 Samuel 24. In 2 Samuel 24, this is obviously toward the end of David's reign. <clears throat> and in this particular moment, a plague is brought upon Israel because of his sinful choice to number the people of Israel, the fighting men, a census. And numbering your people, a census isn't inherently sinful, but when it indicates something about where your trust is being placed, it is sinful and it becomes an issue. And that's why judgment falls upon him for this. And so <clears throat> he says, let's go, verse um, 2. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Dan is the northernmost point and Beersheba is the southernmost point. And number the people that I may know the number of them. And Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people <clears throat> a hundred times as many as they see, while the eyes of my Lord the king shall still see it. Why does my Lord uh, the king delight in this thing? Now, that should have been oh, clue number one that David had stepped into something he didn't need to. If Joab, and if you know anything about Joab, he's not a good man. He is not a positive man. He has his own agenda. Rarely does he, is he concerned for the right thing. He's more concerned with evening scores. When Joab looks at you and says, you think that's the best idea? You know, it's one thing when a, trust, when a righteous, trusted advisor says, maybe you need to rethink that. But it's another thing when someone who's completely, really unrighteous, he looks at it and goes, even I know that's not a good idea. That should be something that really grabs our attention. Or it should have grabbed David's attention. But it didn't. So he sends him out and he numbers the, the fighting men in Israel. So in verse 9 it says, And Joab gave the sum of the numbering. Uh, of the people to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. Verse 10, But David's heart struck him after he numbered the people, and David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. He knew it. <clears throat> as soon as it was over, he, he knew it. I shouldn't have done it, but now I've done it. And he realizes that he is <clears throat> in trouble. And so God sends Gad on this occasion. Nathan is the other one you remember of the other major mistake in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. So in verse 11 it says, When David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go say to David, thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, Shall you have three years of famine come into your land? So he's going to give him three choices. Three years of famine. Or will you flee for three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or will there be <clears throat> three days pestilence? Three options. Three years, three months, three days. Three years of famine. Three months of fleeing. Three days of pestilence or disease. David says... I can't pick. Let me fall into your hands, not into the hands of men. And so God sends a pestilence upon the land. And so in verse 15, the Lord sent the pestilence on Israel in the morning <clears throat> until the appointed time, and there died from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was doing it, It is enough. Stay your hand. And so then David is told that he needs to take an offering. Okay, He needs to take an offering and he needs to go to a specific place. Verse 18, Gad came to David, go raise up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Now, <clears throat> Aruna the Jebusite, that's 
that's a way of saying it, it seems as if anyway it's a way of saying that he is still he's a gentile still living in the jerusalem area okay you remember jerusalem didn't come under the control of david until like second samuel 5 for all the reign of saul and for years before that it was not the capital in israel and so now it has but he's being called to go to aruna the jebusite and there to build an altar at his land and there to offer an offering that will stop the plague, that will halt the punishment. Okay, And so he does that. He goes and he travels. And in verse 22, Aruna said to David, <clears throat> Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burn offering and the threshing sledges and the yoke of oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the lord accept you. But the king said to him. So Aruna the Jebusite who owns this land is offering to give him everything he needs for the sacrifice. But David's response is, No, but I will buy it from you for a price, for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that, to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. I'm going to pay for it. I got myself into this. I'm buying the land from you. I'm buying your property. In essence, I'm buying you out. And here I'm going to make the offering. And when he makes the offering... <clears throat> Verse At the end of verse 25, so the Lord responded to the plea for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. Now, it does not say it in the text just yet that this is Mount Moriah, but this is Mount Moriah. Okay, we'll, we'll see that come up here in just a moment. And so, <clears throat> we've got David going to a place, purchasing some property in order to appease God's wrath, to halt the punishment that has been brought upon the men in Israel, the fighting men in Israel, because of his foolish decision. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the second occurrence is not really... When we see it, it seems somewhat simple, but then we start to really understand the significance of what is taking place with Moriah. And so if you go to Second Chronicles chapter 3, I know... That is a perennial favorite in people's Bible books and their reading. And um, in Second Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord, which is the temple, in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So this text is significant because we've got multiple things happening. Number one, we've got an explanation of 2 Samuel 24. We've got an explanation of its location. We're told he buys the property and offers a sacrifice, but we're not told exactly where it is. This tells us it's Mount Moriah. Now, it also launches us into the future because on this place, Mount Moriah, God is having Solomon construct the temple. And so every time in Scripture when you see that people are going to the temple, they're going to Mount Moriah. It's, there, there was a reason it was called the Temple Mount. There was a reason they said, <clears throat> for an example, in Luke chapter 18, the parable that Jesus gives of the tax collector and the Pharisee, two men went up into the temple to pray. That's not just a catchy phrase or just a common way of saying they went into the temple. They literally went up. You had to go up the mount. Okay, that's why <clears throat> some of these songs of ascent in the Psalms to journey to a higher place in elevation. Psalms of degree is what they're called, I think, in the King James. Um, <clears throat> your tr these are songs that would be sung as they were traveling up to the Temple Mount. So why is it significant <clears throat> that on Mount Moriah you had a punishment that was halted on the people of Israel? But then this was a place where, honestly, blood flowed continuously so that God's wrath could be appeased. That's what the whole sacrificial system in the Old Testament is about. Now, you and I understand, because the writer of Hebrews tells us that there were issues with those sacrifices. The, the animal sacrifices were insufficient to remove sins. But in those sacrifices is a remembrance made. Okay? And it wasn't until the blood of Jesus came, Hebrews 9 and verse 15, 
that allowed those sins to be forgiven, quote, in actuality. We're talking, I understand, in fine point technicalities on that. But so, in this place, Solomon builds the temple where everybody, every Israelite who, is, who struggles with sin, which is all of them, they come to this place and there they have an animal killed so that God's wrath would be appeased. The day of atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, which we talked about recently from Hebrews 9. That's what's taking place on Mount Moriah. Okay? So we're seeing somewhat of a pattern develop. Now we want to back way up. We want to back way up in biblical history into Genesis chapter 22 into Genesis chapter 22 where the gospel is preached to Abraham in Galatians chapter 3 in verse 8 that's those are Paul's words he said God foreseeing that he would justify the Gentiles through faith preached before the gospel to Abraham saying in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed now when you look at that construction of all the nations of the earth being blessed in your seed it doesn't exactly match any of the times in Genesis that is word for word it doesn't exactly match any of the times that God says it the one that it is the closest to is found in Genesis 22 now, when you think about Genesis 22 and <clears throat> what came to be known as the Akita or the binding of Isaac, you start to see a picture. So you, we ask ourselves, okay, how is the gospel being preached to Abraham on Mount Moriah? Well, let's just read it for a second. <clears throat> So after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and cut the wood for the burnt offering. And he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. <clears throat> Uh, then Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and we will come again to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering my son. So they went both of them together. And when they came to the place of which God had told them, that is Mount Moriah, Abraham built, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took his knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And then he names the location. <clears throat> All right, so how is the gospel being preached to him? Well, there's many parallels you could make. Let me put it that way. Okay, here are seven of them very quickly. Number one, you have an only begotten son. Isaac, the term begotten is a much debated term in the New Testament. But the word itself, the thing that all people agree on, which is where I would rather camp out, is that what the word means, only begotten, it means the only one of its kind. Okay? It's the only one of its kind. For an example, Isaac here. He's the only begotten son. He is not the only son. Okay? And he's actually, <laughs> in that sense, if you took beget literally, 
Well, then Isaac doesn't even fully fit that realm. Because Ishmael was also begotten through natural means with Hagar. But that's what leads us to the idea that only begotten talks to us about a special purpose. Because Isaac was not the only son of Abraham, yet that he is called his only begotten son when you look at Hebrews chapter 11. So you've got an only son, an only begotten son, an only son of promise. Well, what do you have in Jesus? The most famous verse in Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So you're, the individuals who are being offered up are both only begotten sons. Number two, you have, and you see here as they get ready to go up to the mountain, the place to be sacrificed... Who carries the wood? Isaac does. The wood upon which what will happen? He's going to die. Jesus carries his cross, bears his cross. At least to the degree that he can. Of course, you remember Simon of Cyrene steps in and, and, and helps him. Number f- uh, three. <clears throat> he is offered as... In, when God tells him to go and offer Isaac in verse 2, he tells him to offer him as a burnt offering. He is being viewed as an offering. He's not just saying go kill him. He's saying he's being viewed as an offering to God. Jesus is an offering to God, a, well, uh, a sweet-smelling savor to God, Ephesians 5. Okay. Furthermore... <clears throat> When you look at Isaac, what do you have? It, it's well been noted that, Isaac, that Abraham, is, he was already old when his son was born. Okay? Exactly how old Isaac is, is, is kind of hard to, to nail down exactly. He's a young man. Late teens, early 20s at least. He's in the vigor of life. His father is well into his 100s. Okay. If Isaac wanted to resist, it wouldn't have been hard. He voluntarily climbs up on that wood. And thus the notion <clears throat> with Jesus, he didn't have to offer himself. He voluntarily went. This is what he told Peter. He's like, look, I I mean, I don't need you to defend me. If I want to, I can call 12 legions of angels right now and end this thing. It's something that he's choosing to do. That's why John, the emphasis is on the phrase in the Gospel of John, laying down his life. I think you can also make the argument that Isaac was dead for three days. Now hear me out on that for just a second. So God tells Abraham to offer his son. And three days later they arrive and then they go through the process of offering. The way you read the story is Abraham doesn't balk. He goes straight through with it. And that's, we're studying, we'll get to this eventually uh, in our studies on Abraham that we're doing. But basically, Abraham has reached the point to when God tells him to do something. This is the crowning moment in the Abraham narratives. When God tells him to do something, he does it. He doesn't question it. And for those three days when they were traveling, what did Abraham know? He's as good as dead. Because there was no way Abraham wasn't going to do it. So he was dead for three days. People say, well, that's kind of sin. Well, just wait. It gets a little bit, gets a little bit thicker as you go. Um, <clears throat> and further, 
he was dead for three days and also Isaac was raised. Now that's not my argument, that's the writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19, when it says, <clears throat> He that was in the act of offering up his only begotten son, talking about Isaac, it said that he had faith that though he killed him, God was able to raise him from the dead. Now listen to this. From which he did receive him, figuratively speaking. You see how he's interpreting it? He did receive him, figuratively speaking, because the boy was as good as dead. He got him back after three days. <clears throat> but for the purposes of our study, where did this take place? Mount Moriah. Where, where was Jesus crucified? Not, and obviously not in the temple complex. But you and I both know when we talk about a mount or a mountain, we're not talking about one specifically secluded spot, that that is a mountain. We're talking about a, many times a vast range that's involved in a mountain. Jesus is crucified outside of the gates, outside of the city, which is filled with other Old Testament imagery of sacrifices. <clears throat> and so you have the place where they are offered, the similarities. Now, <clears throat> in, in piecing these things together then, so in 2 Samuel 24, something was sacrificed in order to stop a plague in 2 Chronicles 3, something was built so that things could be continuously sacrificed to appease God's wrath. And Paul said in Genesis 22, God preached the gospel to Abraham. A father offering his only begotten son for the sins of the world so that the plague of sin could be halted and God's wrath would be appeased which is Romans 3, 21 to 26. You see, we, <clears throat> when we come and we look at these stories that seem to be in some way disconnected or, or disjointed or, you know, I mean, who even reads the Chronicles, some people think, you know? Why would you even read that? Because you would miss one of the greatest images that God has ever laid in Scripture of what He was doing. God, <laughs> there's a reason why when Jesus spoke to the disciples in Luke 24 and He opened up the Old Testament to them, where they said, You know, we're, we thought He was going to be the one who would redeem Israel. And He said, Oh, foolish and slow to believe all that the prophets have written about me. And He began. And using the Old Testament, he explained to them how all of this had been predicted. Well, it wasn't necessarily, although it was in certain places, predicted with some pretty clear imagery. A lot of times it was there. It was lying beneath the surface and they just needed to link them. And that's what Mount Moriah is about. It's about linking those moments and seeing all the things that transpired there to find their fulfillment in Jesus and in his atoning death. And so <clears throat> people say, okay, that's okay, somewhat of a decent image, but what has it got to do with me? Well, Mount Moriah is pretty significant in your life. It's pretty significant in mine. If that's where Jesus died, it's one of the most significant places in history. And when we go down into the waters of baptism, we're being baptized into his death. We're meeting him at the place where he gave his life for us. It is, figuratively speaking, a Mount Moriah moment. 
By the way, you remember Abraham? I didn't really emphasize it when we read it. Abraham named the place the Lord will provide. When a person with penitent faith steps down into the water to be baptized into the saving work of Jesus, the Lord provides. And we can be certain as children of God that even if we struggle, the same God who provided and helped us with our greatest need, which is sin, will help us then. Actually, in the words of Paul, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up freely for us all, shall he not also with him freely give to us all things? His point is, he gave you his son. Is there really anything you think he would withhold from you? He will provide. And so maybe we need to be encouraged along those lines. If we need to pray together, help one another, we want to do that as we stand and sing this song.